the last 20 years, I've been training aspiring dog trainers. Before that, I worked with dog owners. I recognize that most of you taking this course want a well-behaved dog, but have no intention of becoming dog trainers. So you're a different kind of animal from aspiring trainers. Let me explain. Dog trainers like to train, and I mean really like to train. At the San Francisco SPCA, where the academy used to operate, we'd issue training students a new shelter dog to train every two weeks. These people who have self-selected to become dog trainers, once handed a dog, would go at it several times a day, sometimes for hours at a stretch. We couldn't stop them. Now, partly this is because there was pressure on them. They had a laundry list of behaviors to train to a certain standard with a hard deadline. But that wasn't all of it. Their appetite for training was limitless. We'd have frowny staff meetings about how to get the students to train less and not burn out the dogs they were issued. In contrast, when I previously worked with regular people, I'd attend conferences where the frowny meetings were about how to get dog owners to practice. And I mean practice at all. That's what I mean by a different species. Trainers find the process of training intrinsically reinforcing. Most owners, by contrast, want the product. They want a trained dog, but the grind of training is usually an odious chore. They feel impatient with how the whole enterprise moves at bio speed. Let's face it, we live in a society where we're used to instantly downloading any book we want to read, streaming any movie we want to watch, and having a phone in our pocket that literally connects us instantly to everybody on the planet. In stark contrast, even the cleverest dog is going to learn at bio speed. And even with the latest, best, and most efficient training technology, there's going to be, for most non-trainers, what's going to feel like a lot of labor. No way around it. The sheer amount of repetition makes a modern sensibility feel like nothing is happening, or something must be wrong. So part of my job in this course is to get you itchy to train. Maybe not the kind of bad out of hell volume of a trainer, but enough to get the dog you want. I also suspect that some of you will actually catch the training bug. You'll find the process intrinsically fun and interesting, but not all of you. And if you're in this latter group, I promise to make it as painless and as fun as possible. And I also promise that if you put in the legwork, you'll get results. I'm less worried about your dog, by the way. He's going to think he's died and gone to heaven. So on to our first topic, getting the behavior. In a future lesson, we're going to talk about the range of pre-installed software your dog comes bundled with. But we want to get you up in training early on, so we're going to prioritize getting good at leveraging a particular software suite your dog has, and that is his capacity to change his behavior based on his experience. This is known as operant conditioning, or in traineries, OC. It is quite simply the manipulation of behavior via the manipulation of consequences the dog operating on his environment to achieve outcomes. Tattooed on the inner eyelids of every dog trainer I know is this phrase, dogs do what works. This is a fully exploitable system because we control most of the stuff that dogs want. The particular method we will be using draws from the rules of OC laid down by B.F. Skinner, as well as his early grad students and intellectual descendants, Marion and Keller Brelland and Bob Bailey. What these three did was take the basic principles out of the laboratory and into applied settings, the messy and distracting real world. They trained thousands of animals of scores of species to do just about anything you can imagine and with stunning reliability and efficiency. So what do they have to tell us about dog training technique? A lot. First, Know your criteria. Criteria represent our contract with the dog. What exactly does he have to do to win? Second, no seat of pants training. Use a training plan. Good training is more like baking than cooking. In cooking, improvisation and creativity are a routine. But when baking a cake, two cups of flour means two cups, not one and a half. In the guidebook, you will find detailed training plans for all the behaviors in this course. The more faithfully you adhere to them, the better you will do. The next technical skill is how we change criteria. Specifically, do we do so empirically or by intuition? 
The answer is empirically. We are going to use objective measures to progress, or go backwards, in our training plans. We're going to train in sets of five reps and count how many he gets right. If he gets four or five out of five correct, we will make it harder. This is called pushing. We push to the next step in the plan. If he gets three right, we'll repeat that step. This is sticking. We do another set of five reps at the same level. And if he gets two or fewer correct, we're going to go back one step. This is called dropping. We drop back one step. The alternative to empirical criteria change is training by feel, which is one of the ways amateurs get themselves in the soup. He seems to understand. I think he's got it. The behavior looks fluent to me. <sighs> However compelling it might feel, human intuition can be misleading. We inflate and deflate how well we think endeavors are going, and this makes for inefficient training. In fact, trainers with the very best instincts can at best match empirical criteria change. So let's cut to the chase and use empirical criteria change. The specific thing that happens to buy feel trainers is that they inevitably end up with a suboptimal rate of reinforcement. Rate of reinforcement is the number of reinforcement events per unit time. It's usually expressed in X per minute. Training with a vetted plan and empirical push drop stick will keep us in the rate of reinforcement Goldilocks zone for novice animals, which is 8 to 12 per minute, not too high and not too low. So we are going to push, drop, or stick depending on the numbers. We will also sometimes do what's called splitting. A split is an extra step that we insert into a training plan when a dog is stuck between steps. The previous step is too easy, but the next one is too hard. So how do you know it's time to split? The answer is two attempted pushes. For instance, you get five for five on step two, but one for five on step three. So you drop back to step two, repeat the process, and the same thing happens. A five for five, and then a one for five. When you attempt any push twice and the dog can't do it, that's your cue to split, to come up with step 2.5. Sometimes it's easy to come up with what 2.5 will look like. If the dog is nailing a five second stay, but flunks a 10 second stay, a good split would be seven or eight seconds. Other times it's tougher and it's more qualitative. In the plans we will be using, there are a few spots where a known minority of dogs typically need splits. There are alternative plans with these extra splits, and we'll go over them in case your dog needs one or more of them. But your dog may need splits at less common spots, so you may have to brainstorm splits on your own. The next taggy point I want to go over is when we will be attaching cues to behavior. The short answer is further on in the process than you're probably used to. If you're old enough, you might remember the Zenith TV's motto, the quality goes in before the name goes on. This applies to well-executed animal training. It means that most of the time we are going to build behavior, go pretty far along in a training plan before we ever say sit or down or whatever the cue is going to be. Another metaphor I like is that of breaking a bottle of bubbly on a built ship. We don't christen piles of sheet metal and bolts with champagne. Likewise, we don't name unbuilt fledgling behavior most of the time. Why am I calling them cues rather than commands? Why do we care about this terminology, hair split? Well, it reminds us that cues are just information to animals, that a contingency is an effect, and what specifically he can do to be reinforced. We can't command behavior the way we command a computer. Behavior is pulled by consequences, not pushed by cues. Even old school trainers who use a ton of coercion can't command behavior. They can only cue their contingency, do it or else. And so one habit I'm going to try to get you to break is that of chanting cues, of saying sit or down more than once. The cue isn't sit, 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 it's sit. Cueing behavior is like tennis. Once you've given the cue, you volley the ball to the dog. It's his turn. He either does the behavior or he doesn't. 
then it's your turn again. You pay or you don't. This whole process is made muddy by stuttering cues over and over. So if we're not commanding, how do we make the behavior happen in the first place so we can reinforce it and make it stronger? There are three ways. One is called prompting. We help and coach the dog to do the action we want. For example, if we want him to spin in a circle, we can get him to follow a toy. Once he does the behavior, we can reward him with that very same toy. Or it might be a treat in our pocket. After several repetitions, we can then start to reduce that prompt so that the dog performs more and more on his own. This is called fading a prompt. It's a very elegant technique that we'll be using a great deal. The second way we can get behavior we're trying to train is called capturing. Capturing means being observant and paying the dog whenever he happens to do the behavior spontaneously. Over time, it goes up in frequency. For example, some small dogs spin in circles at times, all by themselves. If, whenever he spins, you praise him or give him a tidbit, he'll spin more and more over time. This is lawful. When spinning is at a sufficiently elevated frequency, we can attach a cue to it. We'll talk about this more later. The third way to get behavior is via shaping. Shaping means paying an approximation, a partial version of the target behavior. So for example, if a dog never spins in a circle, you could pay him for turning just a little to his right. He starts turning to his right a little more often. Because behavior is always variable, some of those turns to the right go a little further, some go a little less far. You selectively pay those slightly further ones. They go up in frequency and then you select the turns that are even a little further than that. You do this until eventually the dog is spinning in a circle. In actual practice, these three methods, prompting, capturing, shaping, are not mutually exclusive. For example, we will very often prompt approximations of target behavior, and we'll prompt behavior in sessions, but we might also capture it if it occurs spontaneously between sessions. Let's go over a bit more of the animal training jargon we will be using. Trials and reps are the same thing. Any instance of you asking in some way for a behavior, the dog doing the behavior or not, and you paying or not, is a rep or a trial. Contrast this with the term event. Events are the smallest unit. They are the atoms that make up the molecules of trials or reps. So a cue, like the word sit, is an event. A prompt is an event. The dog sitting is an event. You paying him is an event. In operant conditioning, we have three events. An antecedent, which will be a prompt or a hand signal or a verbal cue, a behavior, and a consequence, which might be the dog getting paid or the dog not getting paid. The latter two events are a contingency. If you sit, then you are paid. If you don't, then you are not paid. The cue is information to the animal about which specific contingency is currently in effect. The final term I want to introduce is parameter. Parameters are the ingredients that make up training plans. They're the variables whose difficulty is manipulated at each criteria step in the plan. For instance, a standard downstay plan has three parameters, distraction, distance, and duration, around which distractions must he hold the stay, how far from you must he stay, and for how long. Another one of the places amateur trainers get into trouble is missing parameters in plans. If the terminology feels a bit of a muddle, don't worry. You'll develop fluency through use, and there is a glossary in the guidebook. We are about to do our first training session. I want you to go easy on yourself and on your dog. So what are the priorities? What techie pieces do we care about? First things first, paying. When your dog gets it right, pay him with something he really values. Pay every time until I tell you otherwise. Next, feed for position. Pay a sit while the dog is in a sit. Pay a down when the dog is in a down. I will remind you about this in the demos. Finally, Plan adherence and criteria change discipline. Use the plans and do your best to count. Push on four or five, 
stick on three, and drop on two or fewer. Don't go rogue here. We're baking, not cooking, remember. Okay, so what do we not care about? Keeping perfect count. Do your best. Now, this doesn't mean don't count at all, just don't sweat losing count. Everybody does. Don't worry about fumbly mechanics. You'll get better with practice. I drop bait all the time. Wait and see. Finally, your dog's pace of learning. He may need many, many criteria drops and splits, or very few, or it might change depending on the task. It's very much like the specific aptitudes people have for math versus English. Here's the great part. He'll get better at learning the more you train him. Our first behavior is sit from a standing position, which is not the same thing as sit from a down. Sit is a Swiss army knife for greeting, jumping up, requesting services, saying please. Caveat specific to sit. Some dogs should not be made to sit. Elderly dogs with osteoarthritis, obese dogs, and dogs with hip or knee problems. If you're not sure, check in with your vet. Let's see how our first session with Lulu goes. Our first behavior is sit, and it's sit from stand. Sit is a great Swiss Army knife behavior. It's good for instead of a context, such as the dog is jumping up, sit instead. Uh, it's a good say please behavior. Instead of barking at the door, sit to be let out. Um, and it's also a foundation for a lot of other things. So as many dogs do, uh, Lulu is an adult and she's already learned sit. However, I do want to show you the mechanics in case your dog has not learned or your next dog or your next puppy. So the first thing we want to think of is that sit is less about the butt going down conceptually than about the head being raised up. The way dogs are built, if you make their necks crane upwards, it is naturally more comfortable for them to crouch down and then sit. Watch again. So head up. If I go too high, she's probably going to jump. If I go too low, it's not going to be a crane. So what we're shooting for is up, so her head is up, and then slightly back, and then just wait. Don't do it repeatedly. If the dog doesn't go right away, if your dog does not know sit and you do this and she doesn't immediately sit, don't worry about it. Don't just keep re-prompting. Do a single prompt and then just wait. There. It's a better habit for you to get into, and also it's gonna play more heavily on our desire to kind of get the dog to say, you know, I'm craning my neck, it'd be more comfortable if I sat. And as soon as they sit, position feed. So I'm going to feed her as soon as her butt hits the ground. I'm not going to feed after she restands for the next trial. Okay, so I'm ready to go. I've got my training plan here to refer to because I don't want to go off plan. And we're going to go ahead with plan A of sit. If it turns out that your dog cannot be lured into a sit, there's a plan B because that is a common sticking point for many dogs. And we are going to go over that in a future lesson. But this is plan A. So I'm going to first of all prompt it fully, pay it. That's a one for one. Prompt it fully, pay it. Two for two. Prompt, pay, three for three. Now don't worry, she's looking very smooth because again, she's an adult dog who's already <coughs> learned sit. But the procedure is the same if your dog doesn't, just it's gonna take a little longer once you deliver the prompt. There we go, four for four. And then five for five. Now immediately, while she's still warmed up, I'm going to step two in the plan, and that is the identical movement, but with nothing in my hand. I wanna very quickly, Divorce the idea in her mind that she has to see the food up front in order to get it after she behaves. Okay, there's one for one, two for two. Again, I'm always gonna position pay regardless of what step I'm on. So then she doesn't go, I'm just gonna wait. We're on a two for two for sit. There she goes. Position pay it, good girl. There she goes, four for four. 
five for five. If your dog gets stuck on this step, so if your dog was being lured quite readily into a sit, doing it for the prompt, but then when you go to the empty hand, you try two times to push to that, and you have difficulty. Your dog's saying, no, -uh, show me the money. I must see the money first. There's also a split for that, which is plan C. It's a set of splits, and we will be going over that in a future lesson. But for now with Lulu, because she did that smoothly, we're going to go on to down from sit, and sit was the prerequisite for that. So I'm going to go ahead and pay my setup sit because I'm going to consider it a relatively fledgling behavior. And then once she's sitting, my mechanics are this. I'm going to go ahead and let me get her sideways to you so you can see a little bit better. I go straight down, oh, and if she pops, my first order of business is I cancel for popping. So even before we're thinking about down, we're going to be thinking about the dog's rear. So if I prompt and she gets up, I cancel the rep. She resits, I'm going to pay that. Cancel, pay my sit. Cancel. Oh, now she happened, I got a lucky guess there. I'm going to go ahead and pay that lucky guess, kind of serendipitous. Straight down, very good. And then I pay in position. I'm going to go ahead and just reseat her, resit her. And I'm going to show you this later, exactly how to do that, but she just went ahead and did it. Notice my luring mechanics. What I'm not doing is luring forward or back, I'm luring straight down which can feel a little bit counterintuitive because the tendency we have is to think, well, the dog's going to be kind of going forward into down, but that is even more likely to prompt a stand, which is exactly what we don't want. So watch again. Lures in my hand, straight down, boom. Soon as the elbows, her two elbows are on the floor, that is my signal to pay. Now, because I've been talking, I've lost count, so I'm going to call that a three-ish for three. And I've gone ahead and dropped bait. I've made good on my promise to you. Good. Pay my setup sit. Straight down. Wait for it. Elbows. Four for four. Back up she goes. So I'm just right now, I'm waiting for my sit. So she's, this is sort of thinking, well, what's going to work here? What's going to work? And then she gets into her set. I'm going to go ahead and pay that because later on I'm going to want that. So I'm putting that in my pocket for later. Boom. There's a five for five. So I'm going to do just as I did for sit. I'm going to immediately fade that prompt and see if she'll do it for the empty hand. Lulu. Let me reacquire my dog. What a good girl. So empty hand for sit. I'm just going to wait for it. There we go. Pay that and then empty hand for down, and lo and behold, I got lucky. My first rep, I'm a one for one. Now, because sit from down is newer, I'm going to go ahead and just lure that, and I'm not keeping track. Here we go. Empty hand, and she went. Lucky me. Good. She's nice and warmed up. I'll lure her back, so I'm going to stand up to lure her back into a sit. And again, this is new. This is just a setup behavior, so I'm not too worried about keeping track of it, but I'm going to pay it when I get it. Empty hand. Good girl. Straight down. Good. And she went. I'm really lucky. That's a three for three. Very often when you go to the empty hand, the first couple of reps, the dog is, I'm sorry, I don't see anything in your hand, so I'm getting lucky. Straight down. Pay. Resit her. Now, it's okay to have the dog just naturally go into a stand and then reset them. Don't worry too much about that part. Empty hand, straight down, and she went. There we go. That's a five for five. So, Lulu did very well, but remember, she's an adult dog and she's already got some sit under her belt. What I want to talk about now is people often ask about, well, how, you know, what kind of down should my dog be in? There are actually three kinds. And what you've been seeing Lulu do is called a sphinx down. That is where her two rear legs are kind of tucked in like that, where she's on her haunches. And that's the most kind of spring-loaded kind of down. For longer downs, and part of the reason we want to teach down is it's going to be a good duration behavior. We're going to actually segue this to a down stay. 
it's actually better for a stay for the dog to be rolled onto one hip. And the way you get that is you take the dog's nose and you prompt them that way. Oops, <laughs> and then pay. So what I'm waiting for is you saw her little right leg come shooting out. That meant that her left leg got tucked under and she's on one hip. I'm gonna get her back into a sphinx down. See, now she's in a sphinx down. If you can see her rear quarters are tucked up like that. Sometimes when you're doing downstay, the dog will just naturally say, boy, if I'm gonna be here for a while, I may as well make myself at home and comfortable. But if your dog doesn't and you wanna get that hip right away, that's the way to prompt it. Let me show you one more time. So she's already in a down, she's in a sphinx down, nose kind of to her own flank. Okay, and now she's in a rolled on hip down, which was much better for stay purposes, partly because the dog is more comfortable. And also, if she's going to break, I've got more lead time. I can see the first movement of that upper quadriceps. So let me get her back into her rolled on hip. So I'm just waiting for it. She's saying, I'm gonna stay in a sphinx. I can target just fine in a sphinx. Thank you very much. So I'm just gonna keep waiting until she rolls, lo and behold, she does, pay that, and the dog will get more fluent with time. Eventually, you'll be able to just fade that to a signal. So if you notice, when her right quadriceps, which is visible to me there, that's the first hint that I have. It's the canary in the gold mine that she's gonna break her stay, okay? And timing really matters. Later on, when I'm going to be training this day, I wanna tell her, ooh, that's a mistake. The earlier I can do that, the faster she's going to learn. I'm not gonna be muddling my messages to her. Timing really matters in dog training. And so let me show you one last time. So she goes, and I'm gonna artificially get her to break her stay. Watch that, see that leg? That would be when I started, to, if I was training a stay where I would tell her, there's your error. Okay, so let me show you the third kind of down. The third kind of down is called lateral accumbency. And basically in dog training ease, we call that a bang down. So the dog is basically playing dead. They're fully on their side. So the first thing is get that. And then once we've got her there, I'm going to actually pull her, not this way. I'm gonna pull her towards her own flank again, that way. This can be vulnerable, as can be uh, the down on one hip for some dogs. Some dogs feel more secure in sphinx position. And so be really patient. If your dog is not willing to do it, it's not stubbornness. Usually it's, uh, I feel a little bit vulnerable. I want to be spring-loaded. I want to be get, getting ready to, to get up in a flash. So once they learn that it's safe, though it'll go more quickly. But they're not gonna learn that it's safe if you're in a big hurry. Okay, so I'm gonna go towards her, boom. And once that, see, at the moment, my criteria is that her left shoulder, so this left shoulder here, as soon as that's down, I'm gonna pay. I'm not gonna demand her head to be down yet because she's not 100% comfortable doing this. Whoops, so that was an error and I just don't pay that. All I do is not pay it if she, if she does that. If she does, oh, I don't wanna go, I'd rather do that. Oh, and then she does, the left shoulder went down and I pay it. Then if you can, once she's there, then work on the head. And the head is basically stretched this way. Can okay, that's lateral recumbency or play dead. So if you were gonna be teaching your dog the trick of play dead, we're gonna be doing tricks later. This is not one of them. This is how you would teach it. And you would use the same procedure. You'd first of all prompt the position, then get rid of that prompt, and then make the prompt more and more stylized, and then add a cue. And the usual cue people would be sort of shooting the dog um, with a gun. Okay, the last thing I wanna talk about is dogs that take treats too hard. And that's very normal. We kind of call it shark mouth or barracuda mouth very affectionately. Some dogs just, they're very eager and you feel their incisors on your finger whenever you go to give them a treat. And it's actually something you can fix. There are three phases. The first phase is to work on it in a dedicated fashion when the dog is warmed up. So basically, you would take your dog and you wouldn't demand any other behavior. And when they go, ow, take it hard, you just, ow, tell them it hurts. And then wait, ooh, that was a softer one. So I'm gonna hold out for softer ones. Ow, 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 that one hurt too. Ow, eh, borderline. Ow. Ow. 
Oh, what a good girl, softer one. And you would keep doing this until in the training session context. So when the dog is warmed up, you can't stump them. They will eventually get to the point where every single time they're taking it softly. Once you're at that stage, the next thing you would do is work on the behavior cold. And that would mean the very first rep of the day. So you haven't been practicing over and over. The dog isn't warmed up. And this concept of warmed up versus cold is something that's going to come up again later in some of our behaviors. And it's important for behaviors that are sensitive to warm up. And also for behaviors where we really do want performance the first time. Sometimes we don't in pet dog training, but sometimes we do. And taking treat, treats hard is one of those times. We don't want, ever want the dog to hit us with those incisors. Ow. Ow. There we go. So what I would do is once I can't stump her when she's warmed up, I would give her only one chance a day. Okay, so basically, or maybe twice a day, but put hours in between. So it'd be like the huge kind of massive $500 penalty. I would offer the treat, and if she took it hard, this time she took it soft, so I'm going to give it to her. If she did take it hard, I'd say, ow, and I'd say, we'll try again later, and we'll try again tonight. And the dog gets only that one chance. And what you'll find is over days, they eventually say, you know what, I've got only one chance. I'd better get it right immediately. We can't start with that because it's too hard. The dog would never learn. You've got to have it warmed up and then cold. And once you've got that in the bag, the next order of business would be to do double criteria. You would then incorporate it into your training sessions. So then, if I was training sit or down or stay, when I went to pay her, not only must she make criteria for the sit or down or stay, she also must collect the treat nicely. So in other words, even if she gets it right, I'm going to go out if she she takes the treat hard, and then I'm going to make her do it again. Okay, so there's that little cost of, you're going to have to do that behavior over again. I need you to do your down and take the treat softly. And then you'll have a dog who takes treats nicely in all contexts. As you start to train, remember to go easy on yourself. It's going to feel contrived and clunky, even if you've trained a dog before. I'm asking you to work in a very specific way and it's going to take practice. So don't be precious. Do your best to follow the big ticket rules. Pay, pay in position, stick to the plan, keep count as best you can, and change criteria, push, drop, or stick, based on those numbers. You'll get better as you go along, I promise. And this is important. Notice how much fun your dog is having. For him, it's mental stimulation, interaction with you, and winning prizes all rolled into one.